Actually, it's more like 1,600 tons of wood chips, give or take. What you're looking at is a train unloading fuel for the McNeil Generating Station, a biomass power plant in Burlington, Vermont. McNeil can generate 50 megawatts of power by burning 76 tons, or roughly three truckloads of wood chips, every hour. Wow, wood chips! And burning these wood chips provides Burlington with about 43% of its electricity. But aside from burning a lot of wood, Burlington is also known as the first city in the U.S. to run on 100% renewable energy, a title they've been proud of since 2014. But how exactly do they do it? Is it really possible for a city to be powered entirely by renewable energy? It seems like everyone wants to go green these days. Green cars, green housing, small green planet Earth models that you can hold in your hands, and green energy. And, not surprisingly, what might be the most green city in the United States is located right in the Green Mountain State, Burlington, Vermont. So we decided to head over to Burlington to see what all the fuss was about. What do you like about Burlington? What do I like about Burlington? Yeah. Oh man, you know, Burlington is uh, just a wonderful city. This is Moreau Weinberger, mayor of Burlington, a position held, at one point, by this guy. We have great food, we have great arts, we um, have incredible access to the outdoors, uh, and at the same time, in a lot of ways we have the kind of familiarity of a small town. Back in 2004, the city was sourcing only uh, about 25% of its overall generation from renewable sources. Um, made the decision that they were going to do better than that. They were going to try to get to, to 100%. And um, in what I think is a pretty fast period of time since then, we've gone all the way from 25% to, to more than 100% of our power sourced from renewable energy. So can you kind of just give us a general overview of where the electricity in Burlington comes from? Sure. This is Neil Lunderville, General Manager of Burlington Electric Department. So we have uh, the four main food groups for uh -huh. uh, for renewable power. Biomass, which we get about 43% of our power from biomass. About 33% of it is from hydroelectric power. Uh, the third uh, major group is wind. Uh, we take power from Georgia Mountain Wind and Sheffield Wind, both in Vermont. That's about 23%. In the last little bit, that little 1% is from solar. And we have solar here in our building. We have solar at the airport, plus we have uh, um, homes and businesses that have solar inside of Burlington. That, that amounts for a very small percent, but if you take all those together, mm -hmm. uh, biomass, hydro, wind, and solar, that comprises our portfolio. Since we were in the neighborhood, we decided to take a cruise and check out where Burlington's power was actually coming from. Where are we heading to first? We are heading to the Winooski One Hydroelectric Facility. All right, thanks, you lead the way, sir. My name is Ryan. What, Dave, what's your name? Dave. Dave. Nice Dave. to meet you. I'm the director of generation here at the McNeil plant. Okay, cool, cool. So, uh, so what, what do you guys do at the McNeil plant? In the McNeil plant, we basically uh, we're taking wood chips, we're burning them in a boiler. When the wood chips burn, the boiler makes steam. Steam goes down to a turbine. Turbine spins, it's connected to a generator. Generator makes uh, electricity, goes out on the line. Uh, this plant burns roughly around 75 ton of wood an hour to produce 50 megawatts of power. Uh, throughout the year, uh, uh, we'll burn roughly around 400,000 ton of wood. 400,000 tons of wood. That's roughly equivalent to 600,000 trees a year. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, biomass because um, it seems to me like you're still, you're, you're burning wood chips essentially, right? And you're yeah. getting power from that. I mean, that sounds pretty similar to like burning coal or, or any other sort of fossil fuel. Like how, how is that renewable? How is that different from burning fossil fuels? Uh, it means quite a bit. Trees regrow. These are sustainably harvested wood chips. So the foresters will go in, they're gonna selectively harvest trees to allow for bird and bat habitats. Um, then we're gonna be taking the tops of trees and, and limbs of trees, grinding those into wood chips. You know, we're transporting them extremely efficiently. And we're actually now, we're going back and re-harvesting areas that were harvested 25, 30 years ago when McNeil first came online. Meaning that we are regrowing 
our fuel source that is renewable and we're not you know we're not clear cutting it and building a shopping mall right <laughs> you know we're going back and, and replanting it or let the forest do its replanting and we're doing it in such a way that that we will have those resources for generations to come but burning though that's still it, it, would you consider that green energy it's still i mean you're still emitting carbon into the uh, the atmosphere there are a lot of schools of thought on this mm -hmm. we would say that and this is a well-known science that new trees are going to be absorbing more carbon um, than older trees. When we are cutting and allowing the forest to regenerate, we are also putting in uh, forests that are soaking up more of the carbon that's in the atmosphere. So while we're still burning the trees, we are doing it in the most environmentally sensitive kind of way. The technology right now doesn't allow us to run the grid on just solar power or just wind power or just hydro. We need something that's more baseload. Biomass power um, can be 24-7 power, mm -hmm. which is important. And so we would say the biomass is a lot better than burning oil or coal or even natural gas. So compared to oil and coal, trees do seem to be a lot more renewable. And if the forest is growing back at the same rate as it's being burned, then in theory, biomass should be carbon neutral. But what about the plant's other emissions? In addition to CO2, when you burn wood, you release other harmful things into the atmosphere like nitrogen oxide and particulate matter. So that's the smokestack behind me. And uh, I don't know if you can tell or not, but it doesn't really look like there's anything coming out the top. Uh, but I'm sure there is because the plant's running. Okay, so we saw the incinerator. You're burning the wood chips right now. Uh, but I'm looking at the smokestack. It doesn't look like there's any smoke coming out of it. Yeah, there is explain. no smoke coming out of it. We have a series of pollution control devices here to limit what goes up the stack. And the main job of the operator is to, to monitor that continuously when the plant's online. We That's capture right. all the ash. We have a limit on opacities. Opacities like a particular matter. Right? Okay. We have an electrostatic precipitator that does collect all the ash. Cool. The ash generated by the boiler is saved and later used as a soil conditioner or a base for building roads. McNeil's particulate and nitrogen oxide emissions are well under state and federal limits. So as a generator that gets its power from burning stuff, it's a relatively clean one. But outside of the pollution controls and state and federal limits, it was hard to deny that these power plants just felt nice and clean. The hydro plant was a park, there was a guy walking a dog, a turtle, a fish elevator, no joke. And the biomass plant even smelled good, like fresh cut cedar. It wasn't what I usually thought of when I imagined what a power plant was like. I actually used to live down the street from a coal plant, and this was different. These were power plants you didn't have to hide on the outskirts of town. But even though the power plants were clean and carbon neutral, there had been some other criticisms of Burlington's 100% renewability claim. One other thing that uh, I've heard mentioned is that um, occasionally you have to buy um, extra energy from other sources. Can you talk a little bit about that? So we buy power over the course of a year. Um, there are going to be points in our peak periods where we may not have enough power to cover our needs, so we would go back to market to buy that power. When Burlington Electric goes back to market, the power they buy is a residual mix of power from the grid, which could technically come from anywhere, including nuclear, natural gas, or even coal. There are also points, usually in the winter, where we're long on power, meaning that we have power to sell, so we're selling back into the market. Um, but over the course of the whole year, we've got enough power contracts to cover all of our power needs with renewable sources. And in the future, when more renewable sources come online, they won't have to rely as much on market power. In order to keep their power affordable, Burlington Electric will also sell off a lot of the power they produce in the form of renewable energy credits. We sell class one renewable energy credits, which are the, the highest kind of renewable energy credit. And then we take what we, we make from the sale and put it back into keeping our rates low. After we sell the class one recs, we go out and we buy class two recs, um, an amount equal to that we sell. So it's a way to use the market um, to keep our renewability um, in place, while at the same time allowing our customers to benefit from our kind of aggressive stance on, on renewable power. But there's more to Burlington's plan than just buying renewable energy. The key to really staying renewable is to cut down on the amount of power that you use. The truism in, in energy is the cheapest kilowatt hour is the one that you don't use. In fact, we use less electricity today as a city than we did in 1989. Whoa. More than 25 years ago. With our efficiency program, we are working directly with our customers 
both our large customers and, and our residential customers to provide them with a package of incentives to help them move over to more efficient products. So for our residential customers, it might be as simple as changing out their light bulbs to LED light bulbs. But our large customers, we're working with them on efficient building design and we can provide really meaningful um, cash incentives. I mean, that sounds kind of expensive though. Like how, how can you afford to do that, provide cash incentives? <laughs> oh, it's still a lot cheaper for us to provide an incentive than it is for us to buy that kilowatt of, of energy from renewables or from somewhere else and serve it to them. So the population of Burlington is 42,000? Yeah. I, I mean, so somebody watching this video in Chicago will be like, okay, well we have over two million people here. Like, right. how how is this possible um, on a mass scale in, in big cities? And like, is this even something that's, is it really that significant? You have to step back from looking at the size of the cities and, and look at the technology itself. We are seeing a massive change, revolution in, in energy. The system that we have had for the last 100, 110, 120 years in electricity is breaking down. And we're really moving away from this old style hub and spoke system where you had one big giant power plant in the middle pushing power out to all these little homes and businesses to a one that's really decentralized. So we're looking block by block, house by house, to create your own microgrid where you can create power on the roof during the day, store in your basement for nighttime. Pretty soon, every block in Chicago could be its own utility. And that's a great thing because that is a system that's gonna be more resilient, it is gonna be more affordable, and it's ultimately gonna be cleaner and greener in the decades to come. And as a utility, I would say that the two choices utilities have are to perish or to get with the program. And uh, here at Burlington Electric, we're gonna get with the program. Our customers want control of their destiny and power, just like they want control of their own phone and their computer. And that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's the secret of the future, I think. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> secret of the future, there we yeah, go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Is Burlington on the right track? Is it actually important to use 100% renewable energy or is there something else we should be focusing on instead? Let us know in the comments or hit us up on Twitter. Also, huge thanks to Miguel Franco. He's been a longtime supporter of our show and a contributor to our Kickstarter campaign. He's got a YouTube channel called Mario of Seven Stars. If you're interested, there's a link in the description. You should go check it out. Thanks, Miguel, you're great. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And special thanks to our Patreon subscribers for making this episode possible. Last week, we asked you whether or not we should feel responsible for the monk parakeets introduced to the Chicago area, and this is what you had to say. Steph D said that we should take responsibility for these birds because a lot of the species that we think of as native now weren't always native. And if the monk parakeets weren't affecting the ecosystem in disastrous ways, we should just let them be. Grant Hurst said, unfortunate as it would be for the monk parakeets to die off, that's just nature. We shouldn't go out of our way to remove them, but we also shouldn't go out of our way to try to save them. And Nikos Mines said something interesting. If these birds managed to survive the recent harsh winters, that probably means they are hardier and their children will be tougher too. And hopefully over time, they will become a new species specially adapted for the climate here in Chicago. Next week, we're gonna look at one of the most important inventions in US history, a simple device that reshaped the entire landscape of our country and brought an end to the Wild West. Barbed wire. Yes, barbed wire. Uh, you'll just have to see the video uh, to understand. All right, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.